I am very pleased to welcome Mary Bondurant Warren today to the Athens Clark County Library. Uh, many of you already know Mary and she practically doesn't need my humble introduction, but I will tell you a few things about her. She's a fifth generation Athenian and a sixth generation Clark Countian. Uh, she's the mother of five children, all of whom learned to do research and use computers very early on. Uh, she has an uncanny ability to enter a repository and discover documents of formerly unrecognized significance. She's a founding member of Athens Historical Society and served as president in 1962, 1997, and 1998, and she co-edited the Society's first publication in 1964. She also oversaw the publication of the Society's Athens Clark County Cemetery book in 1999. And she began her historical and genealogical writing career in 1962 with the Lives and Legends newspaper column. She launched Family Puzzlers in 1964 through her company Heritage Papers and is still producing illuminating abstracts of records from Georgia's colonial period, which, which require frequent trips to London to examine original records. I'm very excited and pleased that Mary has uh, put up with our technical issues this morning, and I uh, welcome her up to the podium. Thank you. Athens. Notice the modern transportation. We had just gotten the railroad, and the omnibus is bringing passengers to and from the train. There is no bridge across the river, so the railroad station ended at Cars Hill. And if you missed the omnibus, you had a long run down Oconee Hill before you got to your train. That's Lamar Dodd's version from the same spot. He thought he could get to the place where the former painting was drawn. And this was done in the 1950s, I think. All right, that's the University of Georgia, just before the Civil War. Notice that we didn't have quite the extensive campus that we have today, and it was called Franklin College. We still had cows roaming about the streets, and that's the reason for the sty over the fence. You had to go over the fence to get to the campus. Lucy Cobb was founded, and you've seen it on Millage Avenue, but I swear you haven't ever seen it looking like this. And look at the girls in their fancy dresses and their parasols. And they're walking along what was just a dirt path, the road to Watkinsville, now Millage Avenue. It was a girls' school, and it was started here in Athens at the behest of Tom Cobb's sister, who wrote an anonymous letter to the newspaper saying it's a shame that we have to send our daughters away to get an education. The school was founded. Money was collected to build this fancy building and to hire teachers. And Tom Cobb had a pretty sizable family, but he had a daughter named Lucy, who was just about the right size to go into this school. And he and his wife, Mary, were very interested in its success. Unfortunately, Lucy died just before school opened. And so in honor of his efforts to raise money for the school, they named the school Lucy Cobb. And this is where Lucy would have gone. Commemorate Lucy, Tom Cobb and his wife Marion gave these albums to the, all the graduating seniors the next year. They not only gave the album, and that's the young lady who got it later in life. But they wrote these two commemorative pages at the beginning of the books. Tom Cobb goes to the Civil War and is killed on Federal Hill, his mother's family plantation. He bleeds to death from a femoral artery puncture. But this, this, went, this is one of a number of the albums of the heart that the two cobs gave to the children. Now here is Athens just before the war. You think we've got too many steeples. Well, it's not exactly accurate because the little steeple on St. Mary's Church on Oconee Street wasn't quite that high. But we did have a growing town when the, when the Civil War began. 
And this was the top of the hill, and the double barrel cannon stood there after the Civil War, but it had not been thought up at the time the war began. And that is a Stanley house that stood right where First American Bank stands now and had a beautiful view down the hill. And it was that house that I wrote about in the tangible past. Okay, there weren't many Republicans. In fact, there weren't Republicans at the time in Athens, but the problems that we had, the South had already set their heels against having Lincoln as a winner for the election. And so they were primed to give up and to separate. They'd already started states' rights and been fighting about that during the 1839 to 1850, all the way through Congress, trying to keep the, the ban on slavery in some of the new states to the West. It got worse and worse. And so by the time a Lincoln's election was announced, the South was primed to break apart. I mean, it, we were just, we were on the brink of leaving. And the North knew it, and the South knew it. And so the people who were the political heads here were very definitely involved. Tom Cobb and his brother Howell. Howell was the first president and was offered the presidency of the Confederacy, and he declined. And this was the meeting that was held at the State House in, in Montgomery, Alabama, when the Confederate states were put together. But this gives you a problem. There were so we actually had a convention at our capital, which was Milledgeville, in which the delegates to the convention voted to take the state of Georgia out of the Union and join the Confederacy. And there were a number of very prominent Athenians who were there and voted for us. 1861, well, we actually had a flag by then. Now, this is pretty quick because the election was late 1860. Here was a flag already thought out and, print and made. Most of the citizens and work in favor of the Confederacy and the ones who weren't headed somewhere else. They asked to be removed from school without having any damage to their scholastic uh, career because they wanted to come back and finish school, but they wanted to go and do what they could for the benefit of the Confederacy. As well, you can understand. So the, uh, the trustees of the university said, well, if you leave school in good standing, you can come back. And so many of the young men dropped out of school immediately. Some tried to finish. They volunteered. This is an Augusta view at the armory. The law school students closed. Only two who hung around were given their degree. Before long, though, there was Confederate conscription, and so we had no problem with being a student. You got drafted, but most of them had already volunteered in the first place. So the university, they just shut down completely. That means the, the professors had no work no money. The buildings were empty, but the buildings were quickly filled by refugees. Now, here is the beauty of the Confederate. They are volunteering. But what's left in Athens? The students are gone. A lot of the professors went off to war as well. All that's left is the ladies and the old men and the young boys that were really too young to go to the army. Mitchell's Thunderbolts are legendary. In fact, they were so full of themselves, they are the old men who didn't go, that when the general wanted to review them, they said that you can come and meet me on my front porch any time between 10 and 12, and I'll be there. So that was the kind of military review, and that is the kind of protection that Athens women knew they had. And they are the thunderbolts. They are drilling now. The servants are holding the umbrellas and carrying the guns, but the men are in marching to some unknown drummer. What do you do for mail? 
Once the border between the Confederacy and the Union closed, how are you going to get mail? Thomas Crawford had previously been the Athens Postmaster and for a while he actually signed the letters and I understand that there are several <coughs> envelopes surviving with Thomas Crawford's signature in lieu of a stamp until the Confederacy furnished stamps. Anne, do you have one? This is her ancestor. I'd love to have one too. Here's Mr. Stovall. He's gone off now with the cavalry. He didn't want to walk, so he took his horse and headed for Virginia with Cobb's Legion. And Cobb is Tom Cobb from Athens. And he's writing to three, to three young ladies, two sisters and their first cousin, who had donated a gift for him. It was Sir Walter Scott's one of the Waverly novels, and he says, well, he's not all that educated, but he's sure that he'll enjoy it. And thank you, ladies, for sending it. And he is one of the signatories in that earlier album. What's left for the ladies at home to do? Well, sewing is one of the many things. Knitting was another. Trying to mend it and keep the men in clothing. But think of being at home when you can't get what you're used to having, particularly the medicines. Not only had the doctors gone to war, and the apothecaries or the druggists were gone, and the nurses were gone, the mamas had to be Dr. Mom, and it got worse and worse. Now the food supply, Previously, we've been raising cotton and we've been raising tobacco, neither of which you can eat. And so we switched. We tried to grow things that we could eat because if we didn't, we weren't going to eat. Well, so you didn't have coffee. You didn't have tea. And Dr. Coulter, the blessed head of the history department when I was in college, went through the newspapers and other places and collected up and published a Confederate cookbook, although he had never cooked a day in his life. But he has some of the most outlandish substitutes that they had tried to make to take the place of things that they really enjoyed eating. You and I pick up a salt shaker and shake it. We don't realize the difficulty of getting salt out of the ocean. Plenty of salt in the ocean, but how are you gonna get it out when you need it? Georgia actually took troops to the shore to try to crystallize enough salt <coughs> to make it so that we could help preserve our own meat. We had to have the salt. There's no refrigeration. And so if you killed meat, you had to have salt to, protect, to uh, petrify it, to preserve it. And so it was such a critical item that they actually took troops trying to learn how to do it on the sly. It was in such supply, such short supply that people were digging up their old smokehouses in order to leach the salt out and recrystallize it so that they could save their uh, meat. Now Athens had a market and the marketplace was mid-block between what is now the city hall in the First Methodist Church on a street that we call Washington now, but which took the colloquial name of Market Street. And in the middle of the block, in the middle of the street was a large building and that was the, the city market. And when anyone had killed beef or pork or had fresh meat for sale, there was a bell on the tower of the market that rang to announce that it was available. And then everybody beat quickly to town to try to get some before it was gone. But that was our marketplace. The council met on the second floor and all the shopping was done on the ground. Governor Joe Brown was very practical and so he asked the farmers, since we couldn't ship out our cotton and get paid for it, nobody much was buying tobacco to switch to things that we could eat, and the farmers did. But if you can imagine 
where the Amos house is at Shoal Creek on the Lexington Road was a man who made caskets and the spokes for wagon wheels. And his business journal survives. It's in Hargard Library at the, at the university. People are buying hay at 40 Confederate dollars a bale in 1864. And just think of what your cow would eat in a winter. You'd be bankrupt. Who's going to nurse the soldiers? Well, there was not, we hadn't really developed a very good system of having nurses to assist the physicians. And so frequently they drafted men from the troops to act as nurses as well. And all the hospitals, they were, I mean, the ones around Richmond, for instance, they used tobacco warehouses. And they were obviously not prepared and comfortable. And as more people were wounded, they piled more people in. And, and the surgical suites were anything but disinfected. And so if you didn't die from your wound, you very well could die from some contagion that went around. I mean, it's just horrible to think of what they went through. And that's the reason that on both sides, more soldiers died from illness than died from wounds. Now, to get them out of this congestion, and we still had some functioning railroads, and Athens had one, they would ship the, the mobile wounded away. And so Athens opened up and took the mobile wounded and nursed them in our town. Uh, what is now the fine new house on Millage Avenue was turned into an eye hospital. And only the ones with eye injuries were brought to, to that spot. But some of our walking wounded didn't survive. And those that died are buried near the, the new flagpole at the entrance of Oconee Hill Cemetery. Well, just imagine what it would be like if you suddenly had to go in and act as doctor and nurse under emergency conditions, as in, let's say, a tornado, and you've got to go and try to save people and fix them up and feed them and clean them up and nurse them back to health. This is what the women of the Confederacy faced. There were also refugees. There were families that moved. Well, where, if they, where are they going to stay? Well, fortunately, the university's buildings were opened to them and they camped out in Old and New College and Demosthenian Hall and Phi Kappa and some of the present and some of the professors' houses on campus. Now you'll find in the Episcopal Church Register the names of the people who were Episcopalians who came to Athens and where they came from. And I've not found it in any other church record, but I haven't been able to see the Presbyterian record, but I know the Methodists and I couldn't find it in the Baptist records when I looked back in the 1960s. But thank God for those vacant buildings because there weren't that many houses vacant that these folks could come into in town. And this is a house that when I was a child was noted to be a haunted house. It doesn't look quite that haunted now because it's down, but it's on Harris Street. And Jefferson Lamar was headed for Virginia shortly after the war began, but he'd married before he left. The story is told in, in Paul's Annals is that after the wedding, there was a, we had gas. The gas is made out of pine knots and it flowed through Athens, and a few houses had gas. And Mary Ann's nurse appears, long since dead, telling her that Mr. Jeff was dead. 
The next day, the telegram arrived. But it happened at a time that there were other people present. And it goes into the newspapers, and it's the talk of the town. And I told the person who is now dead, who bought the portion of that house that was rolled away many years later. And she said, well, I guess that explains it. She has a little dog, had a little dog. And the little dog would periodically go onto the landing between the first and second floor and bark as if there was someone there. And so it may not, the ghost story may not be over yet. Now these were my great grandparents and they married in Covington. He was a commissary for Howell Cobb's unit and he had to travel all over the South to try to get food for and ammunition at times for the unit. She had just had her second baby when she heard that he had uh, dysentery. And so as soon as the doctor would let her out, she and a slave and a wagon and the new baby made a trip across the country to the Mississippi River. And she stayed there until they could nurse him well enough to get him home. They did. They got him home. But the baby died right after they reached Athens. And I've seen a picture in my childhood of the baby laid out on the little sewing table with flowers around her before she was buried. Now by 1864, more and more soldiers were wounded and more and more soldiers were coming home. So the people left in Athens decided that what we needed was really a, an organized method of helping the men. And so they took over old college and they furnished food and they furnished heat and they even furnished slaves to help to manage the place and to give a place to stay for those people who were in transit and it didn't cost them anything. And that's pretty good at a time when you've got a $40 bale of hay to be able to donate food and to donate help and to donate wood to keep the returning servicemen taken care of. Now the wayside home was on this side of the river. The railroad that the men came in on was on the far side of the river. These are some of the actual donations and Mary Ann Abbey is abstracting the wayside home donors list to, be, to publish. They were published each week in the newspaper. How about a bottle of vinegar and two chairs? Well, they had to furnish old college. No telling what was left. But this was really the best idea. So Mr. Williams Rutherford and others, in effect, established an omnibus for the wounded. Basically, it was the ambulance. Oh, it must have been, yeah. But how, it was basically the ambulance that met the train. Yeah. Well, thank goodness that they did it, because how would you, if you were really incapacitated, get from one place to the other? Absolutely. I mean, it's just... Somebody had to carry you. I mean, and, and, and most of these people, nobody here knew. I mean, you couldn't call on Aunt Sophie to help you. It's just, wait a minute. Okay, ready? All right, this is the best story. <clears throat> this is actually a letter that Jewel Stanley wrote her husband, who was in Florida with Howell Cobb. Now, Aunt Sally Harris's house was a casual on plantation out at High Shoals. And the house stood until the 1980s or 90s when it was being restored and it burned from com combustion of some sort. And notice, one of the Confederate soldiers here is sick. Well, they took in somebody they didn't even know. But so did everybody else. It was necessary. Well, 
Well, Stallman's Raid was attached to the Union Army, and the Union Army was between Marietta and Atlanta at the time, and they struck out to try to cut the railroad around Macon. And they got as far as Sunshine Church, and there was a set to with the Confederates, and the Raiders lost. And so they head back to try to get back to Sherman. And what's left in Athens, as you know, were uh, the Home Guard, our uh, venerable men, and the few young boys who could carry, and maybe a, the double barrel cannon without the chain between the balls. And so Ed Lumpkin, who was in the artillery but had come home on leave because of wounds went with the artillery out to the top of the hill above Puritan Cord Mill in an emplacement that's now a churchyard. And when they saw the Yankees on the far side of the river, they plopped a couple of cannonballs and spliced the horses. And the men decided there was a great force on the other side of the river and they better leave. So they turned back and went up to Jer to the Hog Mountain Road, and they took it towards Jug Tavern, which was what we call Winder. Now this is the bridge that the Confederates had removed the rail, the uh, flooring from, so that the Yankees couldn't get across. And this is the gun emplacement. And this is the route from the Battle of Atlanta area down towards Macon until the Stoneman's Raiders were beat and how we caught them up in the northeast corner just above Winder on Mulberry River. Now Breckenridge is from Kentucky, but Breckenridge two generations before had come in to Georgia in 1768. And so when his men were being feeded at the chapel, he said he was just paying Georgia back for the kindness that they gave his ancestors in 1768. But it was his men who had been following all those two and a half days, the Stoneman's Raiders. So they catch him in the middle of the daybreak. And of course, you know that the Raiders are worn out as well as the pursuers. And there were a lot of slaves who'd attached themselves to the, the Stoneman's Raiders. And so when cavalry comes through, the slaves run into the Yankees. And the Yankees then try to get across the bridge. And the bridge won't hold all of them. And the bridge falls. This is the Army of Northern Virginia's apologia trying to tell it their way. And believe me, it is a whitewash. That bridge protected by artillery is the one cannon up on the hill above the paper mill. And by the time they'd gotten to Mulberry River, they were caught. A stampede now took place, a portion of the men rushing for the woods and the balance running down the road and attempting to cross the bridge over the river. In their rush, the bridge gave way, precipitating many of them into the river, and the men now scattered in every direction. Now, the thing that isn't true is that they were, that all of the Confederates were massacring the Yankees that got away. Now this is the Confederate side of it. And this is a lady living at the house at the top of the hill. This is the rest of the letter. Now, I don't know whether old George Jarrell was hung or not, 
But I do know that Mr. Klutz, who lived in what is now Coney County, was picked up by the Stoneman's Raiders and taken into Atlanta. And from Atlanta, he was sent to a prison in Illinois and died. Both of them were together in that prison. They were. And George died was, about a month Was before. Gerald there? Uh-huh. They're both buried there. Okay. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah, right. But now, uh, Diana Terry's mother was a descendant of Mr. Klutz, and she said that they had never heard from him after that morning that he was taken. That's when correct. The, the, family yeah, never the family never knew what happened to him. I just think of that. They never knew. They figured he was dead, but they didn't know whether they hung him in Atlanta where or uh, where yeah, or what happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what, a, what a shock. Well, the 400 or so that we did capture were brought back to Athens, and they used the fence around dear old Franklin College as a POW camp overnight. And while the poor Yankees were putting up with the townspeople who were there looking to see if they really were human, uh, the Athenians were giving a banquet for the Confederate troops in the, old co I mean, in the chapel. And it is said that the leftovers went out to the starving uh, Union forces in the middle of the campus. There are newspaper reports that there were a number of people on the Confederate side who came and who verbally abused and wanted to physically abuse the captive Yankees, but they were removed the next day to Andersonville. This, a woman went shopping with a wheelbarrow to carry her Confederate money in. She brought her package home in her pocketbook. Inflation was so bad that if you're giving $40 for a sheaf of, of hay, what were you paying other things? What cost did you have? Terrible. The state of Georgia recognized that the money wasn't doing any good anyway, and so they decided to help to pension and to provide for the wives and the widows. And what they could, they had access to thread, and thread was in very short supply. And if you have to keep your clothes together, you need thread. And so they paid the ladies in thread, and they paid them when they had salt in salt, knowing that the, the women could use these as a barter for what they really did need. And so th imagine how you must have felt, though, when a hank of thread came instead of a check in the mail. Then comes Appomattox. In 1865, a man from Iowa comes in and he, quote, seizes Athens. He goes to the local newspaper, which at that time was a Southern Watchman, and he presents the editor with a nice choice. Uh, set this type or else. And so they did. And I'll show you a photocopy of the original. The university buildings, instead of being the wayside home for the Confederates, were now the home of the victorious Yankees. And there's a, the university has a copy of the Watchman edition that was edited under the gun, and it praises the gentlemanly behavior of the Union soldiers and other things like that. And everybody who was in Athens at the time says it's a lot of hogwash. Here come the men. They didn't have any kind of assistance, financial or otherwise. And if they weren't taken in by a kind household, they had to sleep out under the trees. 
But once they made it home, the worst was over because even though we had nothing left, they were welcomed back into the bosom of the family. Ms. Morton Hodson's second husband's grandfather was a Confederate soldier from Alabama, and he told the story that the grandfather got a ride on the train as far as Athens, and his uniform was unbuttoned, and the buttons were peach pits. And a young, nice young lady saw him and chided him for being so poorly dressed, you know, to have buttons out of peach pits. And he explained to her that the Union soldiers, where he had surrendered, had carefully taken off the buttons as souvenirs. And so some other lady had put the peach pits in in place so he could close his jacket. This young lady then took him home and fed him and put on some new buttons, not uniform buttons, but buttons on his shirt and coat, and he went on to Alabama. But once he got his health back, he came back to Athens and found this nice young lady and courted her and married her and took her to Alabama. And so Mr. Wilcox is the grandson of that young couple. Appreciate it. If there are any questions, if I'll be glad to answer. Jerry Rich out to Gum Springs, which is now Bell Springs subdivision, and the, the churn, the butter churn, the, the proof papers for anesthesia's priority were hidden out at Gum Springs until after the occupation of the Union Army was over and then they were retrieved and Crawford Long then presented them to medical people to try to get his claim. Of course, a man in Boston is leading to it in the north, but we recognize that he was at first. All right, and you, yes, sir. There were a number of mills and manufacturing concerns in Athens prior to the war. What occurred during the war? How did they, were they able to keep those running? They tried. Now, here is an interesting point. They had both white and black slaves and white free people operating the mills during the war, and they worked together. And of course, there was never a twain shall meet after the war, but there are, they, they had to have help. And you see, they lost the men, the people who had the plantations, they lost the overseers. And frequently, they had to pick a white slave to be the overseer because there was nobody else to do it. But we had the first cotton mill south of the Potomac River, and that's the one that's down part of the medical college now, right on the river at Oconee Street. And that was the earliest cotton mill south of the Oconee River. And then the Whitehall Bill was owned by Mr. John White, who happened to be a British subject, and he had not given up his British citizenship. And so when the Yankees came, the Yankees were very careful not to bother anything with Mr. John White, which I think is rather interesting. In fact, yes, yeah, there's a letter, there's a letter in Mr. Stanley. All right, Marcella Stanley's father was Thomas Stanley, and the Stanley plantation was down at Salem in Oconee County now, but Clark County then. 
And there is a letter from Mrs. Stanley saying that she had heard from the Stanley Plantation and she gives the name of the black <coughs> slave who took Mr. Stanley's cotton to Mr. White so that if the Yankees got it, Mr. White would have to pay for it. And the Yankees left it alone. And there are some things in the newspapers here that you can read that show that the Yankees did not follow Mr. White's mind. And he is mentioned as being a British citizen. So he's been here, what, 30 years? He came down, what, 1829? Yeah, that about. Yeah. <coughs> well, you all admire my expertise there. <laughs> I'll throw this out to you or to anybody. I have not thought about it for a long time because it's been probably at least 10 years ago. The, the wife of the couple who are proprietors of the Nicholson House yeah, on right. the old federal road, was that Gun Springs? That's Gun Springs, that's Turkey Creek. Um, she told me that um, she had been told that what is now a field out uh, between the now Jefferson Road yeah. on Federal Highway and her house out in there had been a, uh, I think, a, a, a parade ground or something or other for the, or a forming ground at the time well, of the Civil War. Well, this could be a militia drill. A a militia drill. drill. They were, they were okay. Each militia district okay. had a drill but ground. Think, but could yeah. speak to that for me? I yeah. got you know, ask anyone who, who did have heard about that. So, yeah, yeah. that stands to reason that if there had been a, an area that the local militia well, the militia, each, the law required that every Georgia county have a drill field within each militia district so that you had no excuse not to show up when you had to drill four times a year. That, that fits because Jerry Rich was captain, Captain Rich. Right, so it's it was his, Rich. his group that he assembled at his plantation, I guess, to his Marshall. plantation, yeah, to his plantation. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, Thumb springs. Thumb springs. Oh, I didn't know that. that well, then that would be the reason why he took Francis Young and Francis Taylor, Francis Long Taylor, right, to marry to was his, his plantation. I didn't know why he had taken that advantage. Well, might, might that have been, my question is that about one of my great grandfathers who came down as a young man, perhaps 18, from, from Hall County mm -hmm. with his horse. He enlisted under then Lieutenant Deloney. Yeah. Might that have been where he had come to? Or, or you know, yeah, he, he Deloney to, was here in Athens. He was he in would, Athens. He, he would, would have come on in. He was enlisted here with, with yeah. Deloney. Okay. Yeah. And do you know that uh, Stephen Brown and Former football coach. Vince Who? Yeah, Dewey. They're working on a biography of Deloney. Oh, does anybody yeah. have any Deloney material? And that's all I, all I know. Okay. I call it, you mentioned him. You remember letters. Connie Bray? Okay, who is Connie Bray's daughter that I ain't married to? Vince, Becky. Stevenson. Tom Stevenson? All right, well, Connie had the only papers, and I would assume that Becky has them. Okay, I'll tell Steve. I could, I, I, it's Stevenson. Okay, I didn't realize. <coughs> <coughs> 